Guys, the rapture is about to happen. We're living in the end times, and the state of Israel is going to save the universe right after the glorious second coming of Trump. Okay, that is something you're never going to hear at a Presbyterian church. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christianity. So, um, especially if you're in America, you've probably heard some sort of preaching or Facebook posts by your, you know, crazy aunt. That sounds like what I said in the intro. Obsessing over current events, particularly usually something to do with the state of Israel and stuff like that. And you will hear this in a lot of non-denominational churches or Bible churches, but you'll never hear this in a Presbyterian church. Because we, like most other branches of Christianity, recognize that that preaching is not consistent with church history. Now, that preaching isn't just a bunch of crazy people. There's actually a theology behind it called dispensationalism, which is a particular and a modern way of viewing scripture as divided into these seven dispensations, and it takes every single prophecy hyper-literally, including the prophecies that refer to Israel, who were God's people back in the Old Testament. So, um, a, an alternative to dispensationalism that a lot of um, different Christians, especially Presbyterians, would agree with is called covenant theology, where instead of seeing scripture through these different time periods or dispensations, we see it as the unfolding of God's covenant. Um, and there are multiple covenants, but they're not divided up into strict, like, like periods of time. So instead of seeing, uh, instead of taking the promises God makes to Israel, literally as referring to biological Jewish people, we see that the church is basically Israel. Israel is God's people, and the church is the continuation of God's people. And God's people were never defined by ethnicity, it was always defined by the promise of the gospel. So that's the essence of, uh, that's what separates covenant theology from dispensationalism. So we would say that um, there's not really a separate plan that God has for the Jewish people that he has for everyone else. The the it's the same rule for everyone. Everyone needs to repent and believe the gospel. Now, some of us, including me, do think that one day God will finally bring biological Jewish people back into the fold. Romans 11 uses language of being grafted back in. But we still see everything through the lens of the covenant. Now, there is a really silly accusation that people like John MacArthur have made um, against people who reject... Um, reject this dispensationalism, calling us anti-Semitic because we don't believe that there's any sort of special plan for the Jews, um, at least other than, like, being grafted back in. And, like, that's just ridiculous. Like, I personally am a Jew, ethnically, and at one point dispensationalism appealed to me because, you know, I had some pride in my ethnicity until I realized that, you know, it's just not grounded in any good historic theology. So... Now I've, I've talked about what covenant theology is not, now i got to talk about what covenant theology is. So we see scripture as divided into two covenants, but not, not like chronologically. So there's the covenant of grace and the covenant of works. Some people add a third covenant, which, you know, I think it, the third covenant could exist or not exist depending on just, you know, what language you choose to use. I'll talk about that later. But the covenant of works is basically um, an agreement God made with humanity, specifically with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And just defining my terminology real, real quick here, a covenant is basically a very fancy word for an, an agreement, specifically that a um, person of authority makes to a person of not authority. So covenants are agreements God makes with us. So the covenant of works is basically God telling us, obey and you will live disobey and you will die. God told Adam and Eve that if they disobeyed and they ate the um, fruit from the tree God told them not to, they would surely die. And Rome, the book of Romans tells that death is a consequence of them doing that. Now, I personally believe death existed chronologically way before the Garden of Eden, but since God is outside of time, we would still say that um, death is indeed a consequence of Adam and Eve uh, disobeying God and therefore 
failing to keep their part of the covenant of works. So that's the covenant of works. The covenant of grace is basically where God says, you do not have to obey to gain eternal life. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why we say salvation is by grace alone through faith alone, which is what I what I talked about in the in the previous episode. So that's the covenant of grace. It's grace because we really don't have to earn anything like we did for the covenant of works. But does that mean God just forgot about the covenant of works? No, the exact opposite. The covenant of works is still fulfilled, but we believe that it's Christ who fulfilled the covenant of works because Adam was our first representative. And in Adam, as a representative, all have inherited death. But because of Christ, we believe that all who believe in Christ all have inherited eternal life because of Christ. So in that sense, the covenant of works, we can still obtain the benefits of it because it's fulfilled for us without actually having to earn our own salvation because there's no way we could do that. That is why the gospel is truly good news. That's why we say Christ truly died for us. And not only do we gain the 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 rewards that belong to Christ for obeying the covenant of works, we believe that Christ also took upon himself the punishment for disobeying the covenant of works. I mean, you know, partially, you know, we still we still die, but um in a real sense, even though Christ never did disobey the covenant of works, he still died for our sins because our sins were imputed to him and his righteousness was imputed to us. And that truly is good news. So, uh, yeah, those are the two covenants. And we believe that um, the Old Testament and the New Testament are not different, completely different dispensations, as the dispensationalists would say. We tend to see a lot more continuity between the Old and New Testaments, which is why we would say that, um, like, the Old Testament law, like the, the sacrificial system, all that, it may seem like it was some a sort of covenant of works, but no, that was still the covenant of grace back then. The covenant of grace goes all the way back, even even to like Abraham. All Abraham had to do was believe. It, scripture says Abraham believed and believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So um, now some people who believe in covenant theology think there was a sort of republication of the covenant of works with you know when Moses received uh, the the law at Mount Sinai. I personally just have a hard time believing that, I, I gotta say. I, I think that there was definitely a law aspect to um, the covenant of works. I mean, sorry, to, uh, to, to the covenant of Moses, the covenant that Moses made with God. So, um, there's also a concept called the law-gospel distinction that's relevant to this conversation. Now, um... The law-gospel distinction is something you will hear a bit more in Lutheran circles than in Calvinist Presbyterian circles, but I think it, it definitely applies. Now, some people have said, okay, the law is just basically the covenant of works, and the gospel is basically the covenant of grace. I think the two parallel each other, but you can't draw, like, an identity between them. They're not identical. Um, so, the law the, and gospel each have their own separate functions. That's what the law-gospel distinction is. The law is meant to make us aware of our sin, and the gospel is the good news that we don't have to be good enough, we just have to believe in, in the Savior Jesus Christ. So uh, that a, a true law-gospel distinction will be effective in both uh, convicting people of their sin and also offering salvation and assurance. So we would say that the Old Testament, there was, in the Old Testament with Moses and the, the Mosaic Covenant, there was definitely an aspect of law, for sure. But it's not as if the covenant God made with Moses was a covenant of works. St. Paul seems to say that the law um, was given to Moses to make everyone aware of their sin. Not that the law is bad, because God's law is is very good. I'm not, I'm not a theonomist when I say that, but objectively... You know, especially like um, the, the moral law, as it's sometimes called, is very good. Um, because it's always good to o obey God, because obeying God is simply objectively good. That's the definition of goodness, is that which is in accordance with God's will. So the law is not bad, but because we have not lived up to the covenant of works, the law makes us aware of that. 
and then it's only once we've been um, convicted of our sin by the law can we actually turn, repent from our sin, and believe the gospel. So yeah, um, that's the basics of covenant theology. One more detail, some people add a third covenant, the covenant of redemption. The difference is, instead of God making that covenant with us, it's basically um, God making the covenant with God. We believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have all had sort of like an agreement to, they all agree on which people to save. The Father elects certain people to salvation, the Son dies for those people, and the Holy Spirit applies that salvation to them. Um, now, of course, if you're a classical Trinitarian, as I believe we should all be, we, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit don't have distinct wills. They, they all share one will. So when, it, when, it, when talking about the covenant of redemption, I think that's only helpful in as much as we believe the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all determine to save the same elect group of people. So um, the covenant of redemption is definitely a particularly Calvinistic idea because Calvinists, um, in contrast to Lutherans or Roman Catholics or other just non-Calvinists, believe that there's a specific group of people called the elect whom God intends to save. And the elect are whosoever will believe, who whoever will believe in, in, in Christ. But we believe that, that their, their believing in Christ is unconditionally predestined. But, um, yeah, I made a video on predestination, my first video in this in this section. So that's about it, guys. Um, that is what uh, covenant theology is, basically. Of course, I only barely scratched the surface, but don't worry. Don't have to worry about the rapture, and when the end of the world comes, Israel probably won't have much to do with it.